All right. Um, first, uh, I want to thank you for asking me to come. I think that, that um, one of the things that I think is important to understand is that um, almost everything I'm going to tell you I knew five years ago. That's a little depressing. Um, some of what I'm going to tell you I knew <coughs> ten years ago. That's even more depressing. It means that we're not, at least as surgeons, we're not really making uh, major strides um, in managing the disease process that affects so much of, of the patients that we treat. And I, I think that's unfortunate, but I have always said that surgery is not the answer for this disease. It's basic science research that's going to find the cure. Um, we just try to manage the effects of disease as best we can and keep people as mobile and as pain-free as possible. But I'm not going to cure uh, fire dysplasia. Every time I have a chance to send bone to the NIH, I give it to them for their research studies because those are the people, the basic scientists, who have a lot more patients and more test tubes than I do. They're, they're the ones that are going to figure out eventually how to solve these problems. Well, um, uh, they're, they're, we tend to be scientists, of course, so we want to guide our treatment in in uh, evidence-based medicine, which is the new, the new byword in medicine. Uh, don't do things just because your professors told you to do it. You want to do it because there's evidence that supports what you're actually doing. And unfortunately, there's very, very few articles on virus dysplasia. Some of the only ones that are really out there are the ones that were uh, sponsored by the <coughs> NIH slash Virus Dysplasia Foundation's consensus conference that we had a few years ago. And the only reason we were able to publish those is because it is a, a consensus type article from experts that are assembled in the field without a lot of statistically valid data. And that's unfortunate. As Mike said, everybody's case is a little different. So you can't apply one solution to every single patient. Therefore, you're not going to gain a lot of statistical validity on what to do with these people. Most of the surgeons I know have seen one or two cases if they're lucky in an entire lifetime of practice. So we gauge our, our treatments based on tumor experience, and this is, this is a, a skeletal dysplasia rather than really a tumor, so it doesn't exactly uh, come across exactly the same way as, as we would treat, for instance, a malignant tumor. Um, I started to get experience with this through uh, Penelope Fulian, who called me one day and, and said, you know, you're only an hour and a half, two hours up the road from NIH when I was in Delaware practicing. And, and we don't have anybody here who really is enthusiastic about helping with the surgical management of some of these patients. Would you like to see some? I said, absolutely, send them on. And, and then she started sending me more patients. And I actually um, had one mom who, who was very, very um, thrilled with the care that I gave to her daughter, Mimi. And she started a, a you know online support group. And the next thing I know, I had lots of patients. So, um, I have accidentally become an expert on fibrous dysplasia. It certainly wasn't anything that I intended to um, spend a lot of time on. And, and the most important thing is, uh, unfortunately, I've learned a lot of things in Delta. Okay? And, and a, a lot of the patients that I treated many years ago, 35 years ago, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't treat them the same way today. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you that. I, I had no idea what I was doing at the start. I, I based my treatment on what I've been taught to do, and a lot of it didn't work. I used tons of bone grafts and found out really fast that does not work. So um, we, we're not going to go through that. We've already done that. So um, the extent of the disease, you know, you know, Mike said, well, at age five, you can tell skeletally how much disease everybody's going to have. Well, why is that? Why can't we tell early? Well, because the limits of our, our detection is basically bone scans. Um, and the disease is there, but we can't find all the spots because they're just too small. So around age five, and that, that is true that at age five, um, maybe six at most, the bone scan will show you every place that's going to be involved. Um, there are no, no new areas that, that doesn't get into the blood vessels and spread around your body like a real cancer would. Uh, but the areas that are tiny and insignificant can become significant over time. So the literature, as we talked about, is limited, and unfortunately people who don't have experience with this condition will look up fibrous dysplasia and they'll get a bunch of articles on monostatic disease. Fibrous dysplasia is not that rare if you put in a bunch of patients who have one spot in one bone and nothing anywhere else. And, and so those are the ones who get collected and they write an article about fibrous dysplasia and it doesn't apply to polyostatic disease. So, I mean, this is pretty easy to take care of. This patient 
um, may or may not have had any pain at all, maybe had an x-ray made because they got kicked in the shin, and this is an incidental finding of fibrous dysplasia in the little fibula bone that doesn't carry much of your weight. Even if it is painful, this is really simple to take care of. The fibula is kind of a not so important bone. You can make a cut here, cut here, and take it out, throw it away, and the patient does it just fine. If it's not painful and it's an incidental finding, you do nothing with it. And most of the time, the fibrous dysplasia and monocytic disease is not very aggressive. It has a different biologic activity from the fibrous dysplasia that we deal with on a routine basis in patients with the polyostotic disease. It's not aggressive. I, I, if you do the um, genetic studies, it has the same mutations, but somehow it acts differently. I, I can't explain that. So to remind people what a normal upper femur x-ray is supposed to look like, I always throw this one in because you know we're so used to, to seeing these really deformed femurs. This is what a child's femur should look like. Um, and and um, unfortunately, this is what some of our patients' femurs look like after uh, a few operations, um, well-meaning but perhaps not well-planned operations or sometimes no operations. <coughs> so the, the disease is very aggressive in the smaller children. Okay, and that's another thing I think I have learned in the last five years. I have learned something in the last five years. There are some patients who have severe disease at age three, and age three and a half, and age four, and maybe they've already had two operations already. I'm coming to the conclusion that some of those patients um, probably are not going to benefit from my repeated attempts to keep their bones straight, and we'll talk more about that later. The bones are thin and weak, um, the deformity occurs early, and the standard techniques that orthopedic surgeons use to deal with broken bones really do not work very well uh, with this condition. Um, I talked about bone grafting. I did a lot of bone grafting. Um, early on, I recognized you can't use the patient's bone for bone graft because they don't have sources of really decent bone to get enough bone to do any good, so I used allograft bone. When people pass on, they often donate uh, their organs, and bone is an organ, and you can donate your bones. And uh, it's washed of most of the protein. It doesn't have to be tissue typed. And there's, there's a long, decades-long history of using allograft bone. And I used tons of really dense, hard allograft bone, and I watched it dissolve away. The virus dysplasia grows around it, and it just eats it away, and it disappears. Cancellous graft. And if you have to use bone graft, cancellous graft, which is the, the soft, spongy bone, is, is fairly useless. Um, I once tried, I <laughs> thought that it was important to try to scrape out the disease with curettes and try to get as much of that out as possible and replace it with bone graft. That doesn't work. It just causes a lot of bleeding, and it is really not uh, productive at all. Um, if you let the deformity get severe, getting back to a normal alignment is very, very difficult. So if you make a decision you want to keep a bone, in reasonable alignment for function. You really can't let it get too far. Otherwise, the, to get back to a normal alignment is very difficult. Uh, I've modified my thoughts on plates and screws a little bit. Right? In the past, I told people that if their doctor wanted to put plates and screws on their deformity, they needed another doctor. Okay? Uh, well, maybe not. There are some um, very nice new plates and screws that I have used, and I'll show you some, some examples, uh, where the screws are locking into the plates now, and that is very helpful in weak bone disease for both adults and, and children for many conditions, not just fibrous dysplasia. So with some exceptions, plates and screws may work in certain situations. This is important. A single operation is not likely to solve the problem unless you're talking about a patient who's 11 or 12 years of age, comes in for their very first operation because of a pathologic fracture or, or weight-bearing bone pain, and they don't have much deformity, that patient, uh, patient might get an intermediary rod placement and go on into adult life and, and not have more surgery. This is the, the exception, not the rule. So uh, we can't cure, but we can manage deformity with repeated operations, but the operations don't last long because the hardware um, is, is placed into soft bone. So why do we operate? Well, I used to operate a lot for control of weight bearing bone pain, much, much less uh, often now because there are medical treatments for weight bearing bone pain that work reasonably well. 
So in the absence of deformity, weight-bearing bone pain as the sole indication uh, for why the patient has had an operation, that has cut down a lot in the last 12 years or so, 15 years. Um, I do operate to reverse deformity, but controlling it is better. Um, and diminishing frequency of fractures. Okay, we, we will hear something about bisphosphonates which help with bone pain, but our, our indication, our studies have shown that bisphosphonates don't really statistically diminish the frequency of fractures. So when people are having fractures in the same bone over and over again, I will often put an intermedullary rod in there to stop that from happening. Even if they do get fractures, they're easy to take care of if there's a rod in place. Um, so uh, you gotta be sure that you're under maximum medical management if you're having weight-bearing bone pain, and that means under the care of a really talented endocrinologist that knows what they're doing, uh, to manage uh, not just rickets, but other forms of uh, uh, bone disease, metabolic bone disease, and then of course the, the use of bisphosphonates has been helpful, and I'm not qualified to really talk much about that, so I won't. In small children that are growing rapidly, uh, to control the femurs especially, you may need surgery every year and a half, two years, to um, deal with the growing bone and replace hardware with new, different, longer, better hardware. So uh, what are my goals? Well, if you operate on a patient, you need to get them up walking as soon as humanly possible. Try to avoid casts. Uh, I do use casts sometimes on tibias. Uh, bed rest is, is uh, work of the devil. You really need to get people out of bed as soon as possible. Uh, and sometimes the parents are my best helpers. You know, if I have to put a person in a cast, they'll, they'll bring up some bungee cords and stand the kid up in the cast and put some eye, eyelets into the table and put a bungee cord around the kid and make them stand up in their cast. You have to get people out of bed. You really shouldn't let, uh, allow bed rest. So I've learned that bone grafting is kind of almost ne never necessary. I use intramedullary rods as much as possible, which early on has been a big problem, because nobody manufactured intramedullary rods for children. Uh, and they're used extensively in adults, but until fairly recently, there were no intramedullary rods going down the center of the bone of the right sizes to be used in children. They didn't sell many of them, so they didn't make any of them. Uh, it's all a matter of what you're going to sell, what you're going to profit from, and, and that you can tell by the size of the group here in this room. Not many people have this condition, and the use or the need for intramedullary rods in small children is not very great. Um, I, I really think if you want any chance of controlling upper femoral deformity, you have to operate early and often um, if, if you decide to control it. Doing nothing um, because you don't know what to do uh, is not the right thing to do. Doing nothing because you have consciously decided that that's what you're going to do, that's okay. But doing nothing because you have no idea what to do is the wrong thing to do. This is a, a kid from Tennessee that came to see me at age 12, and he had his old records at age 3. You can see that the deformity is kind of worrisome, but not too bad. This could be or could have been managed with probably repeated surgical procedures. But now, I, I cannot honestly conceive of a decent operation that will uh, do much for this young man at age 12. Uh, he can stand for transfers at, at the sink, he can wash himself, and he, but he's in a wheelchair. And that's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you have decided ahead of time, that, that your experience and research and your teaching has told you that, that this is useless to try to attack this over and over again, uh, fine, but doing nothing because you don't know what to do is probably the wrong thing to do. Children's bones are different. They have growth plates at the two end that allow them to get longer, and so we cannot put rods in that are designed for adults. Um, I used to do that. I used to get some rods from the Far East that were designed for very, very short oriental people, um, but the companies uh, got in trouble with the FDA for bringing those into the United States because they're technically not the same as we use here although they really are, and so I couldn't get those anymore. So for a long time, I didn't have rods to put into children. The, the, the bones are small, the growth plates, the vices are open, and so I used, this is a humeral rod in a femur. So I, I use rods made for uh, other bones in other bones. Um, so it had to be inventive uh, with the insertion techniques and the, and the um, devices. So the orthopediatrics people had come to the rescue a few years ago, and it's the only company that makes implants specifically and only for children. And not only do they make uh, small size rods, but they make special stuff for me. It's pretty much um, 
almost overnight. When I ask them for a special something, I send them an x-ray and I tell them I need it. Uh, they will custom make stuff for me pretty fast. So th th this has been a great, great company to work with. Um, I'm designing some special femoral rods that I hope to be available in a year or so. That will be even better than what we have now. Specific areas of the body. Hands and feet don't usually cause too much trouble, but if they do, uh, they, rare, they rarely need surgery, but if they do, I do put little bone grafts into the fingers and, and the hands when people have lots of fractures. The tibias are pretty easy to take care of. There's less deformity. They're easy to um, correct with osteotomies. Intermedullary rods of various types are available. If there's repeated fractures, we, we put rods in, and, and a small rod, will, like this old tiny rush rod, Will, will work amazingly well in many patients. And, and the indication is mostly either deformity or pain with weight bearing, and the rods usually work quite well. Um, bigger rods are available, um, but again, you can't, you, this rod is designed actually to be put in from the top through the knee joint. Well, you can't do that or you'll cross the growth plate and then the bone won't grow. So you have to put it in through a slot in the side of the bone. So the techniques are a little bit different. Um, and when the patients are close to the end of their growth, then you can put an intramedullary rod in the same way you would for an adult with a tibia fracture. Remind, remembering the normal upper femur x-ray, this is where we have most of our trouble is the upper femur. Um, uh, it's the most frequent area that I deal with because I don't do skulls, all right? Um, the, the earliest deformity occurs here. Uh, it's the, the, the natural design and the angles at the top cause it uh, to be um, suffering from the forces of weight bearing and the forces of the muscle pull and the upper femur deforms first. And it is the most difficult to keep well aligned. The, in children like this that get uh, a lot older before they start to have trouble, conventional rods that are made for adults work quite well. Uh, the normal angle at the top is 135 degrees. When fibrous dysplasia, it stops, starts to drop way down. And once it gets down, it's hard to get it back up again. So reversing deformity is difficult. I recommend operating early. The femoral neck, um, I think, shouldn't be allowed to get down past 110 degrees or so, um, because getting it back up into the normal alignment is very difficult. Whenever possible, an intramedullary device is better than plates and screws. In some cases, they're not around, not available. Um, for small kids, it's hard to, to get rods that will work, and then they work for a while, and then as time goes on, three years later, you can see that this child's femoral neck is dropping down again, kind of a bad x-ray, so I had to draw around it to show you where the bone is. But um, again, it looked good to begin with, but over time, the result hasn't been maintained. Um, I know a lot of things that, that come to me, patients come to me with things done by other doctors, and and the flexible intramedullary rods, we use those a lot for shaft fractures, but they don't do anything for the femoral neck where the real problem is. This is a fossier duel rod. It's used for osteogenesis imperfecta, real bone disease. It's a telescoping rod that will grow the patient, and it's, it's good for um, mid-shaft femur deformities in growing children, but it won't do anything for the femoral neck, so this person stuck a couple of thin K-wires up there and wired them around, and of course, predictably, that didn't be last very long, the wire penetrated the bone, stuck in the acetabulum, and the patient uh, required revision surgery. I have toyed with this new rod from Canada, which I think is very reasonable, but I've had problems with it, and I'm not too enamored to do that one. Um, it, you see it's fractured, and uh, I've had almost no fractured rods from fibrous dysplasia, this one is fractured, so I'm not too thrilled with this one. Um, probably won't use it again. Uh, that's a gap, GAP, a gap rod. Um, the uh, humerus fractures are not uh, too common, but remember in many of our patients, the humerus is a weight-bearing bone. When you're on crutches all the time, or a walker, now that's a weight-bearing bone, okay? It's not just carrying your hand in space. And, and uh, so weight-bearing bone pain in the humerus, because you're using crutches all day, could be an indication that you need an operation. If you get repeated fractures like this person has several, fra I think three in a year, yeah, it's kind of my limit. If you had three fractures in the same bone in a year, something should be done. Even though taking care of numerous fractures is pretty simple. You don't have to rise them, but if they're fracturing all the time, you don't want to spend half your life in a cast. 
So when they do require surgery, the IM rods are pretty simple to put in um, and uh, pretty easy to do. And just about any combination um, can do that. I will say toward the end here that uh, beware of the aneurysmal bone cyst. The aneurysmal bone cyst is a uh, blood and liquid filled cyst that occurs in a number of conditions, but it's extremely common in patients with fibrous dysplasia. They'll be doing pretty good and then they'll have a lot of pain and you take an x-ray and you know, it kind of looks like just another blob of fibrous dysplasia, but um, unfortunately there's a bone cyst in there that's expansile and uh, the fibrous dysplasia material is soft and mushy, but liquid's even worse. And so uh, and they're very common in the skull, but I've seen a lot of them in other bones. Uh, they're hard to diagnose on a plain x-ray. You just have to be suspicious. Um, it looks like fibrous dysplasia on x-ray. Uh, if you can get an MRI, it's, it's okay, but a lot of the patients already have bunches of metal in their body, so they can't get MRIs. So uh, you have to be suspicious. Uh, this is one here where um, I had to use bone graft, and, and it is a, one of the few times when I will use bone graft in the uh, face of fibrous dysplasia. I'll use the graft to help eradicate aneurysmal bone cysts. Um, late reconstructions. Uh, uh, late reconstructions are, 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 I think, something that maybe some of the adult treating surgeons will talk about today, but I've done a few of these in years past when I also treated adults, which I don't do anymore. But uh, this is a young lady that came after nine operations on her femur. She'd been on crutches basically most of her life. She was 26, I think, at the time. And basically her leg was, was baggage. She was carrying it around on her crutches and her other good leg. And uh, a friend of mine who was a total joint surgeon, we worked on her together, took basically almost the entire femur out, put in a, an allograft femur with a bipolar prosthesis. And 27 years later, she's still walking on this uh, pain-free. Um, I think that it's best to try to make the bones you have work. But as a, as a complete salvage operation for adults, I, I'm surprised this kind of stuff isn't used more often. But I don't do adults anymore. Maybe you can avoid these big reconstructions by doing uh, reconstructive surgery early. Um, you can <coughs> salvage adults with massive allografts and artificial joints. There is a risk of infection, but as I was telling Lynn the other day, or just this morning, um, I have never had a fibrous display to get a wound infection up to this point today. Okay, I don't know why. Everybody that does surgery has wound infections. And I, I have my share, but I've not seen a fibrous display patient yet that had to be treated for a post-operative wound infection. So maybe there's some good stuff about fibrous dysplasia. Maybe it's, it's the huge blood supply that, that makes them resistant to infection. I just don't know. I've got a few cases. This is a, a young lady that, that ended up having uh, pretty bad spinal disease and had to have a spine fusion. I've done uh, a handful of these spines. I do tons and tons of spine surgery on normal kids with scoliosis. And we use normal instrumentation techniques in fibrous dysplasia. And so far, it has worked well. I have never had to operate twice on a fibrous displaced patient having spine surgery. So you need to look for it and watch for it. And conventional techniques seem to work well in the spine. I wish they worked as well in other places. Um, I, I do use plates and screws occasionally. Um, but they have a tendency to do what this one's doing. You see the screws are pulling out because the cortex bone that they're anchored in is crappy. And the, the, the plate is pulling away from the femur. Uh, this is going to fail for sure. It has to be revised at some point. And so there's another um, intramedullary rod. Um, this is a young lady that has reached uh, the early teenage years and has decided she doesn't want to have any more surgery. And she's, she's happy <coughs> to transition into a wheelchair. And it was a big fight between her and her mom about, you know, is she going to have more surgery or is she going to just accept the wheelchair? Um, she's had lots of additional surgery. Now, here's somebody that, you know, I think, honestly, I can do a lot more for because the disease is not so bad. Uh, intramedullary rods uh, are helpful. This is, this is an interesting guide to growth technique where you stymie the growth on this side of the growth plate. It allows this one to grow faster and it'll straighten out a crooked leg. So we have some fairly interesting techniques for uh, straightening out mild deformities. 
that are uh, a little easier to, to do. Okay, uh, I think uh, Mike's giving me the hook here, telling me I need to finish. Um, corrective osteotomies, a young man from New Orleans area um, that um, he worked on one side, got him nicely corrected, and then he developed these stress fractures on his other side and did the same thing on the other side. And he's very functional as an adult. Um, this is a patient that's, that's got really bad disease and never had any surgery, okay? So everybody's different. And you can't apply one solution to every patient. It just doesn't work. Um, so these are patients here I, I feel a lot more comfortable operating on because I know that, that their disease is not so bad they're going to do really well. Here's some plates and screws that, that I'm using more frequently now um, with some reasonable success. Um, so, I, again, surgery is not going to cure fibrous dysplasia. Uh, basic science research is the key. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, pay your taxes. <laughs> I, I, I think surgery definitely has a place for the right patient, and um, and uh, these these are people that help me mostly with my computer slides. I'm really tired. <laughs> uh, all right.